Okay, sir. So can we start? Of course. Okay. Are we ready? So, yeah. yeah. Hey, everyone. Hi. I'm Harsh Divakar. And as today's host, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the third episode of Product Matters, India's largest student-run product event. Today's session is about everything about the user. A product manager must be a champion of customer needs, but involving customers is not about jumping to respond to every request and suggestion. Letting customers into product management at the right moment is key to building better products. But confused about how to build the perfect products for your customers? So today we have the perfect man to answer this question. Joining us today is Mr. Jeff Smith, distinguished product manager at Oracle, the second largest software company in the world. Sir has completed his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from West Virginia University. He is responsible for Oracle SQL Developer, Data Modeler, SQL CL, REST Data Services, and Oracle's newest product, SQL Developer Web. So get ready for an immersive session and get all your doubts clear. Handing it over to you, sir. Thanks for that welcome, and thanks for inviting me to speak with everyone here today. Um, I, I want to say up front, that what I'm going to share is based on my experience and uh, being 45 years old in the United States might vary much differently than what you're going to experience in your career. But I think a lot of the themes around being customer centric and building products that customers will love, I, I hope will translate between generations and cultures and language. I invite everyone to connect with me online. Uh, I should be pretty easy to find on LinkedIn or Twitter. I don't do Facebook, but um, I'm, I'm on Stack Overflow or email. You know, however you can find me, if you have questions about product management as a career, feel free to reach out. And today's session can be as interactive as you want. If you want to send in your questions, we have a dedicated Q&A we'll tackle at the end. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Um, my slide deck has Oracle written on it, and that's just because I was too lazy to go do a generic um, PowerPoint template for today's session. This is not an official talk that I do for Oracle, uh, but I am a product manager at Oracle, and I've been here for 11 years. So a lot of what I know about product management comes from what I've learned um, at Oracle. It says here I'm a distinguished product manager. That just means I'm old. I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I'm going to try to share some stuff that will be useful to you as you're starting out in your career. Um, uh, here's my contact info. So on Twitter, I'm at that Jeff Smith. And on my blog, I talk about a lot of the things uh, about my products, but I also talk about uh, blogging and social media and even a little bit about product management. And if you have requests for content, feel free to drop me a, a comment there. I would be happy to... To, to write something for you, if I think it would be useful to the broader community. So again, agenda, I'll talk a little bit about my background and where I've come from and how I've gotten to the place I'm at. So maybe you'll understand where I'm coming from with my advice and you can decide which of it applies to you and which of it's completely <laughs> out of context for what you're looking to do in your career. I wanna talk about product management as a career path and jobs. Like why are so many people drawn to this um, position now, whereas like 15 years ago, no one had even heard of product management before. And also, you know, there are lots of different kinds of product managers. And we'll talk about things hopefully that are common to most, to most product managers. But again, it's, it's always coming back to my perspective. Um, I wanna share some of the things that I've picked up in my career I don't want to be the type of person that figures out the, the secret sauce and then doesn't share that because most of what I know today are things that I've learned from my mentors, from my customers. I think we're stronger as a community and as human beings if we can help others around us. And, you know, we can you can win as a person at the same time your competition or your colleagues are winning. There's there's room for all of us to have success. Me succeeding isn't about others losing. Talk a little bit about um, users, how we 
get into their mindset, how we build personas, why that's important, why that helps our development team build good product. And then I'll share some bonus tips at the end. I'm very much into or addicted to, I guess, social media and blogging. And I think it's kind of uh, one of the secrets to my success as a product manager. And then at the end, we are going to have dedicated time for for Q&A, or at least it's my intent to go through this content fast enough so that we have 10 minutes at the end for q and I've never done this talk before, uh, and I am battling a cold today, so I apologize um, if I'm hard to hear or this doesn't seem the most rehearsed content in the world because uh, you're going to be my guinea pigs. No, sir, you're quite clear. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. And so if there are issues with the session, feel free to interrupt me, Harsh, and just let me know that if there's a question or if there's an issue with uh, people following along, if they want me to repeat stuff. All right. Okay. So, yeah, this is my story. Um, there are many, many different paths to getting into the product management um, career. I, I have two perspectives now. I, I have my perspective of becoming and being a product manager, and now I'm also a manager of product managers, and I'm hiring people brand new into the career, and I'm trying to tutor them, so I'm going to try to share some tips um, from that perspective as well. Uh, there are lots of different ways you're going to get into the career. You can come fresh out of school. Or you can do like I did, start in the IT you know, industry in general and kind of work your way through the different R&D um, job roles and then kind of fall into product management. There's so many different kinds of product managers. Even um, on the same team, you could have three product managers who have completely different jobs. Um, different teams in your company if you ask them what a product manager does, they could have completely different uh, descriptions. And especially between companies, product management is organized differently. Sometimes it's seen as a marketing role. Uh, sometimes it's part of r and I've seen places where it's part of customer support. Uh, and until recently, it was very rare that there was an actual product department where product management was an individual entity. Uh, where I'm at here at Oracle, product management is part of R&D, research and development. So I'm on the same team as the developers that build the products that I manage. I, I kind of like that. Um, being close to the developers is important. So, you know, I can help guide things as they're built. It's not after the fact. It's not an adversarial approach or role. I mean, there are pros and cons to all the different ways um, product management can be structured in an organization. What's important is when you come in, you understand that dynamic, you understand the role, you understand the culture, and you're going to try to become an influencer, not a dictator, um, over all of the different groups coming together that put your product out there. Um, so when I say there's different types of product managers, um, a lot of times they're separated into like an internal versus external bucket. Uh, you can think of internal as more based on the ins and outs of building products, scrum meetings, managing tickets, writing specifications, dealing with licensing, support. And you can think of external as the person who's more of the face of the product. They're out talking to customers. They're building collateral content. They might be traveling, you know, going to customers on site or going to conferences. And at Oracle, and I've seen at other teams and even in my career, um, it's very easy to get put into one of those containers. Uh, but if someone asks me, I say both. I, I'm just a product manager. I do both sides. Uh, most people would put me into the external bucket because from the outside, what you see is what I do externally. But I am very involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, development of our products. I will say I have a colleague, um, her name is Ashley Chen, she's awesome. Um, she's 100% internal and she deals with things like um, licensing, um, corporate security, um, branding, uh, some of the website plumbing for our product pages and I could not do what I do without her help. She handles all of that stuff and it just gives me so much more bandwidth to 
uh, to do the extra things that I do on the external side. So it's great that I have a team that I can rely on and each of us, we have different skill sets. So, so when I'm hiring product managers, I have an idea of what I want that product manager to do, but what are, what I'm really looking for is someone with um, communication skills, someone who's customer centric. And then when they come onto the team, I'm going to evaluate what they're good at and what they naturally want to do. And then we'll build the role around that if we can. So Oracle is a really big company. Uh, apparently we're the second largest in the world. I think that's, I think that's right. Uh, we are pretty big. We have thousands of products. Um, there are a couple of products we're probably best known for. Uh, we have Oracle Java. Uh, we have MySQL. We have um, our Oracle Cloud. We have like PeopleSoft and all of these other um, SaaS solutions around uh, retail and ERP. But what drew me to the company uh, and what a lot of people know the company for is the database. Uh, the Oracle database is as old as the company is itself. It was the, it was the first uh, product. Um, I think we have something like, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but several thousand developers. Um, and across the entire database product line, we have about 150 product managers. And on my team, we have one, two, three. We have four product managers, and I have an opening for a fifth one. And I could probably hire two more, and that's just on like the developer tools, like SQL Developer, our command line interfaces, REST APIs, SQL Developer Web, the things that you see in our cloud consoles. Um, so, it, it, of those 150 product managers, what I said about there's many different paths to being becoming a product manager and there's many different types of product managers. That's very, very true at Oracle. So um, a lot of product managers at Oracle came from pre-sales. So they were in the field um, and they were technical experts on product and they were doing customer demos and presentations. And so it was a pretty natural fit for them to come into a product role. Then again, a lot of them uh, are Ivy League educated, were in development, writing code and decided they wanted, you know, something more out of their career and they transitioned into um, product management. And I've run into product managers that were hired straight out of school, have no experience um, and are just bright and we're training them up from the ground up. Um, and then there's a lot of product managers at Oracle that don't have any technical background at all, um, but kind of came into Oracle support and are self-taught and are just super talented um, and came into product management. So how I got here uh, was totally an accident. Um, I didn't know that there was a career called product management or product managers. Uh, when I was in college, you got a computer science degree, I thought to go be a developer, um, which kind of made me nervous because as I got more and more into the degree program, I discovered that I did not want to be a professional developer. Um, I enjoyed programming as a hobby, but it, I never got it as a, I, I never became passionate about it or even got to the part where it became an art or an expression of myself personally. I enjoyed all the other things around software. And of course, just as a, as a geek or a nerd growing up, I loved everything about computers. So when I came out of school, um, I was really nervous that I was going to be seen as this huge fraud. Here I have a degree in computer science, but I never really got into object-oriented programming. So C++ and Java were always a bit beyond my grasp. And I, I lacked the desire to go learn that stuff. Um, thankfully, I found the company that believed in me and they gave me a job not as a programmer, but in um, customer support, really. So... Um, I, I came in and I was doing first and second line support. Um, I was doing like support of the software, but more importantly, underneath that software, there were Unix boxes, there were Apache web servers, and there were Oracle databases. And I had taken an Oracle database class um, as part of my degree program. And I had two years experience as an access DBA. So Microsoft access, I was like an administrator for that in a small department that I worked at in, in, in school. And I had a 
kind of not really a career, but I had all of my previous work experience was customer based. So I washed dishes in a restaurant. I worked behind the desk at a hotel. I mowed lawns. Um, I did uh, IT support and like other types of support in college. I was a resident assistant in the in the dorms. So I, I helped students, you know, make sure they stayed alive. <laughs> if there was a fire in the building, I'd get them out safely. So I was always like primed and ready to do, you know, human facing type stuff. So I had a tech background, but I, what I really enjoyed was working with, with people. So in that two years, in this first job, I would go on site, I would do installs and upgrades. If a system crashed, they'd call me, I'd help recover it. I didn't know how to do this stuff. I learned it by doing it, you know, so this was a little bit pre-Google. It was kind of like, just a couple of years or like a few months before Google really became a thing. I remember when I discovered Google, I was like, holy crap, this is going to make my job so much easier. Um, but I really had to learn how to learn, how to troubleshoot, how to read docs, how to you know try things and fail and try to get from one error message to the next different error message. That, that was a win. But even in that short two years with no experience, I quickly became like a trusted go-to um, person, especially on the Oracle database side, because that, that's, that's where I really enjoyed learning and, and doing the stuff the most. And one of the keys to my success there was I found the Oracle DBA on the R&D team. He was the one that would write all the custom upgrade scripts for customers that I would then go out in the field and deploy. Um, and he took some time and mentored me, not like official mentoring, but, you know, I'd go down and talk to him at lunch. If I had issues, I could, I could pull him up on the phone and he would, you know, he would listen to me because I was bringing to him what we were finding in the field. Um, and he was able to impart to me some experience and some best practices tips. So I don't talk about that in this presentation, but if you want to be a product manager, find someone that's doing the job today or find someone that's, um, in the industry that you can look up to and you can um, have you know they're a formal or informal kind of like mentor relationship with so from there i went to um the next software company so the first company i was at there was only like 100 people in this company and we did like somewhere like 10 million dollars a year in revenue so kind of like a startup we didn't call them startups then but i guess it was a startup i had to move um, and when I moved, it was right at two, uh, 2001, around 9-11. So there was a huge economic pullback, tons and tons of layoffs. It took me about four or five months to get my next job. And I kind of lucked into it again. There was a company called Quest or Quest Software, and they sold database tools. And I saw that I had a little bit of database experience and two-year support. So they took a, a gamble on me and hired me. And then so I became the go-to support person for a product called Toad. So I was on the R&D team again, doing second level support, which means people taking the customer calls when they couldn't figure out the question, they would go to the development team and I was their liaison. So I was not on the front lines, but I was pretty close to the front lines and I was seeing where all the problems were coming in. I was seeing where all the pain points were, not directly, indirectly. Um, at that same time, I discovered there was a uh, a website that the R&D R &D team maintained where they tried to communicate with customers unofficially. Um, and I also noticed that we had these uh, user communities. So in this job, I was able to like close all my tickets within two or three hours a day. So I was just sitting there with four or five hours of nothing to do. So I was like, look, I can see where these problems are coming in. I know where the pain points are. What can I do to like alleviate these issues at the source. And so I just started writing these web logs or I started adding these technical um, how-to documents on our website. And then I spent time in our forums and I would ask, answer questions there before they could even get to support. And after a while, as I became more and more comfortable working with our developers, and also more importantly, as our developers saw that I could be someone they could listen to and I wasn't just making stuff up like, oh, that button shouldn't be here. I could say, hey, I look, I talked to 100 developers at AT&T and they're using our product and I'm watching them use it on the screen and it's taking them 12 clicks to do something. I know we can do in two clicks. If we just move this button six pixels, we're going to save 
thousands, millions of people, you know, multiple seconds a day, and they're not going to hate us as much. So I kind of learned how to become like this trusted collaborator with developers from my support uh, background. And I kind of come, kind of became like the go-to technical resource on this very successful product in this company. Um, and after like five, six years of doing support, I needed to get out of there because dealing with customers directly, it was just very stressful to me. I would get mad and angry. <laughs> um, I would tell, I would start to tell these support people that I was supporting, hey, you should just go Google that, you know, which was not good. I, it was not in a good headspace. I needed a career path. And I didn't know what that career path was. Because in support and even development, you go from being a support person to supporting bigger products, or as a developer, you go from building little products to big ones, or the other career path is you go to become a manager of other developers. And I didn't want to do either of those things. I wanted to get completely out of support. But as this specialist type, I was in contact with who I became to know who the actual product managers were. And the product managers at Quest at that time for these products, they weren't product experts. They were pure product managers. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but they were doing the spreadsheets, the pricing models, the forecasting. They were doing the sales training. And they would often rely on me as the product specialist to help them do their job. And so that's how I was exposed to product management as a career. I was able to become like a trusted resource to not just our own development team and not even to the customer community, I was able to become a trusted collaborator, partner with the product management and the marketing groups. So I conned them into letting me come in as a, a specialist on the product manager team. Uh, so I had to like earn my stripes, I guess, or get that experience there. Um, I had a bad manager. I wasn't happy. They weren't going to pay me what I thought I was worth um, after that year. And so I was able to, in the same company, transition over to pre-sales. Um, and pre-sales is, you know, you go out to a, a customer, you have a salesperson who's actively selling the solution or the product, and you have the technical team that's there to do the demonstrations, the installs, answering the technical questions. Um, and so I, I became that person. And it was pre-sales, it was very um, win. It was all about winning and winning the deal. But for me, it was about answering the questions. It was about learning new stuff and sharing all of these things I had learned before um, in my previous roles. The best thing I got out of pre-sales was I had to do the same pitch over and over and over again, but I had to be able to, to listen to the customer to see where their problems were. So then I could then craft the pitch to meet what they needed. Um, and I just got reps, you know, I probably did the same variation, I'd say the same, I probably did 500 to 600 pitches or demos in a year. None of them were exactly the same. Um, and I just got FaceTime with customers. So I was already pretty, comfortable talking to customers because of all the customer support experience I had. So I was very, very successful doing this pre-sales engineering work. And I had made more money than I'd ever made in my career. I think I like doubled my salary almost overnight going into pre-sales. Like if you can get attached to sales, you know, that's where the big money is. Cause if you can help close million dollar deals and get, you know, pieces of that, that's not a bad thing. Right. Um, but again, the job just became very, very repetitive. And I was pressured to sell solutions to customers that didn't need our solution. And then I became pressured into doing like license checks, you know, finding people that were using our software and not paying for it. And I was like, this is not speaking to me. This is not what lights me up. This is not what gets me excited. I'm about working with customers and making them successful and building good product together. So I got rescued. I left that company and went to go work for Oracle. Um, and so for the last decade, 11 some years, I've been working um, for the team that builds things like SQL developer and gosh, like 15 other, 15 other things. And so in that time, um, I've picked up new product. Um, We've gone from a non-cloud company to a cloud company. 
Um, I've had to learn how to go from selling to DBAs to selling to developers. Um, things like virtualization have gone full blown, containerization, CI/CD, Terraform, change management, Liquibase. You know, all like the the tech stack has like completely multiplied the whole time I've been here at Oracle. So I've never really gotten bored um, as a product manager. Um, but I've been able to grow as a product manager. So I've, I've got to do more, be more. And the, the most career satisfaction I get now is sharing what I've learned with other product managers at Oracle to help them be successful with their stuff. I'm very well known in the community. So I look to promote good content from the rest of the group that doesn't have that social media reach that I have. Um, and now here recently in the last, uh, year and a half, um, I actually have a team of product managers that I am responsible for. So I have to kind of teach them how to do all this stuff. That's probably the scariest thing, scariest thing of my career right now is, um, is teaching and being responsible for others. Because it, when it's just you, it's very easy to be selfish and worry about just you. But when you have people that you're responsible for, it really levels things up. This is a screenshot of one of the products that I manage. So at the most basic level, it's type in a SQL statement, hit go, and you get the query results back. And then nine times out of 10, our customers use that to build spreadsheets. Here recently, I'm gonna say in the last five years, product management as a career has like blown up. So like there are degree programs in universities People know about the job. It's even become seen as like a sexy job. Um, so I want to dispel, not about myths or rumors, but I want to add a little bit of um, realism. So product managers don't manage product. Like we are not like the end all be all dictator God of a product. Maybe in some cases you are, um, in many cases, there is an R&D director or developer that owns that. Um, sometimes it's very marketing or sales driven. It's very rare that the product manager at the end of the day has the go or no go or decides what features are built um, going forward. So if you're like, hey, I use software every day and it'd be great to be a product manager and I can tell Google what the next new feature in Gmail should be you probably don't want to jump into the role just yet. You probably want to get a better idea of what product managers actually do. Um, now we can absolutely make an impact on the technology that we use every day. And I do. Um, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a lot about gaining the trust of the people that build the product and being an effective communicator and collaborator and influencer, you know, so when we're building a roadmap, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for the roadmap, but it's collaborative and I can't just put things on there and developers go, oh, okay, I'll go and build that. You know, I've got to sell it. It, it. And you need experience selling and marketing for sure, internally and externally. Another good reason why product managers, I think is becoming a more popular job is people are seeing, uh, you can make good money being a product manager. Um, so this is a U.S. based number, and I know that IT in the U.S. is probably a higher paid career um, than most anywhere else in the world. Um, but in general, product managers are going to get paid almost as well as, if not equal to, senior developers can. So um, I've done support, I've done pre-sales, I've done product management. I have a great mix of good lifestyle, good compensation, and what I think is the best job in software development, which is being a product manager. Because for me, I get to tick all the boxes. I get to talk to people. I get to help people. I get to learn new stuff. I get to sell stuff. Um, I, I'm so glad I fell into this career. And if someone asks me, hey, should I take a look at it? And I'm, I'm like, if you're wired correctly, if you're customer driven, if you like um, solving problems, uh, then yeah, absolutely. It's a career you should look into. 
So we have lots of responsibility, but little autonomy. Uh, it's very easy for us to get basically told it's our fault when something doesn't work. Um, but that's okay. We oftentimes get inordinate amounts of the credit when something goes good. Uh, I have a public face. So a lot of times people thank me personally for having our products. And I'm always like, look, man, it's a team. It's a team effort. I have a hundred people behind me building the stuff that you're seeing. You're, I'm just the person that, that you see. Um, so you got to take the good um, and the bad with that. And a lot of what I do feels like sometimes I'm hurting cats. Um, and cats are strong-minded, they're extremely smart, and they could care less what you're asking them to do. Um, so again, it, it just takes time. You got to get to know different people. By the way, I can be hard to, to work with as well. So it's not like I'm some shining light angel and I'm surrounded by, you know, bad people. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to put that out there as well, but at the end of the day, product managers, you know, we don't, we don't run things, but oftentimes we're the one person that cares about every single aspect of the product. And we're the ones that can bring teams together. And we're the ones that can help the customers and the community get their needs and problems communicated to the development team. So we're often a great conduit. So the different cats. <laughs> um, so we've got development, you know, these are the people that build the product. We have support. These are the people on the front lines that help users when they run into problems. And oftentimes support is staffed by people that really don't know the product either. And they don't necessarily have tech backgrounds. So I spend a lot of time training support and supporting support and helping them build the tools and helping them build the collateral and the information and the documentation they need to support the product. And I know what that stuff is because I've spent time in the field doing the things that they're supporting. Um, if you're brand new into a product, like the most crucial critical thing you can do is get into the headspace of the user as quickly as possible. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, QA, uh, in a lot of organizations, QA is completely separate from R&D. And in some cases, Q&A is actually on the R&D team. It doesn't matter either way. You need to know who your testers are. You need to help them with their test plans. Um, you need to make sure they're testing the right things. Um, again, you need to be seen as a, a trusted um, advisor to them and someone they can lean on and someone that they'll listen to and you say, hey, maybe we need to build some automation tests around this. I'm seeing some issues pop up when we do releases. Um, sales, this is an interesting one for me because all of my products are free. One of the best perks of my job is I can sell products to customers honestly and openly without ever asking them for money. So my thing is, look, I want you to know what our tools can do. And if that appeals to you and gives you what you need, then use it. And if it doesn't, then I want you to go find another tool that does help you. Because at the end of the day, my job is to make sure you're successful with the database, not to convince everyone they should go use SQL Developer and only use SQL Developer. But for sales, they're motivated by one thing and one thing only. And that's why they're good at their job. And that's to sell product to customers. So what I try to do is make sure, again, they have the tools they need to do that. So I'm usually working with pre-sales, helping them out with their demo scripts, seeding them with, hey, these are going to be the gotchas. These are going to be the questions you get. They're going to ask you about the competition. Here's what I think you should say about that. And I'm able to do those things because I did that job. I did pre-sales. Um, and if you're coming in and you've not done that stuff before, um, it's just it's just going to take take a long time to build that to build that up. And the good news is, again, you're not usually going to be a, a team of one. There will be other product managers. There will be other people on your team that have years of experience. Or if you're a startup and everything's brand new, you're going to learn really quickly because you're going to be doing all of this stuff yourself and you're going to get cut a lot and you're going to bleed a lot. So you're going to learn really, really quickly. Marketing. A lot of the marketing I do is guerrilla marketing or like ground marketing. So I don't have a marketing budget that I, I can't go spend a million dollars on a YouTube campaign for my product because my product's free. All the marketing support that I get, I generally do myself. So that's why I do blogging and spend time on Twitter. Like I have 
three product Twitter handles that I use to help put information out there to customers so they can kind of subscribe to and learn from. Um, I do my own YouTube videos, uh, but I also work with marketing on global campaigns and that sort of thing. And I help communicate to them. It's like, hey, here's what developers are running into. So it's a... Uh, it's an it's an interesting relationship. I sometimes tell people I'm in marketing. I think at the end of the day, everyone, especially product managers, everyone is in sales. Everyone is in marketing. So you might not actually be asking people for money or collecting the sales checks, but you're definitely selling your product. You're definitely marketing your product. It might just not be directly. Customers. I make myself extremely available to customers and users. The difference between a customer and a user, a customer is AT&T, a user is a person at AT&T. So I make myself available to both. Um, if a customer is having problems with the product, I want, I want to find out about that as soon as possible and deal someone high up on their side and make sure we have a good relationship and they're seeing good service. But if user, you know, Joe, Joe Bob and, uh, Alabama or uh, Sanjay in Pakistan wants help, you know, I make myself available to them. Like I don't have a service level agreement. If someone tweets at me or sends me a DM on LinkedIn, I don't give them a ticket and say, I'll be with, I'll be back to you in two hours or something. But if I can reasonably help that person, I will. And a lot of times that's just me sending them a link to the docs or sending them a link to a video. Um, one of the great things you learn with experience is you know what to search. You know what the keywords are. You can recognize patterns and problems much quicker than your end users can. Um, I often know the answer to the question before they ask the question because I can just tell how they come at me what their question's going to be. That can be a big detriment to me because I need to listen and I need to read things. I, I shouldn't just assume I know what's happening. So that's where I get in trouble is my experience sometimes gets in my way. It prevents me from really listening to what the problem is and really hearing what the customer is saying. Um, so I kind of have to check myself on that sometimes. I really think the key thing to my success is I, I'm like hardwired or I've learned to like get high or like experience euphoria every time I answer a question. So I spend time on Stack Overflow, yes, because I like helping people. But to be honest, every time I see that little plus 10, plus 25, plus 15 bell ring off, that makes me feel happy. I'm like, hey, I know I helped someone today. I know I at least helped one person. Um, now, also at the end of the day, I know a lot of our users are on Stack Overflow. And I know Google sends a ton of people to Stack Overflow. So while personally, I get content happy from helping that one person. I also know that my content on Stack Overflow has successfully reached like 2.5 million users in Stack Overflow. So that was not a waste of time. And I find a lot of bugs and I build a lot of enhancement requests for our products based on the things we're running into on Stack Overflow. So now, not everyone's going to be wired this way. Um, but if you do kind of have this personality or you do like figuring stuff out and building stuff and breaking and failing and learning, it, I think it's a good skill set that maps into product management. I cannot agree with this enough. Um, happy customers, product growth, you need content. You need something that your users can find when they want to reach out. Like, I can't tell you how many developers I run in today. I, I talk about developers a lot because my customers are primarily developers. So the product I'm building is for developers. Um, but in my space, and I think this is a, I think this is a humanity thing. The number one place people go to learn stuff is YouTube. It's crazy. Like, and I do it too. Like I bought um, some yard equipment the other day, like a string trimmer that you use to like cut weeds and stuff with. And they're all completely different. So when you run out of string, even though you know how to change the string head on one weed eater or string trimmer, it, it can be completely different on another one. So what do I do? I go to YouTube and I type in how to change blah, blah. And then I play it on double speed. And then I fast forward to the part where they actually show <laughs> what I need to do. And that's how developers are learning how to code today is they're watching YouTube you know, videos and tutorials. So if you have product out there, 
that's not ubiquitous like i don't know spotify or uh, outlook or something you know if it's more of a niche technical product and it's not 100% intuitive how to use, you need to have that stuff out there so that when your users run into problems, they find the answers. I mean, ideally we build the product so that it doesn't need that stuff, but it's gonna be impossible to build a product that's so intuitive and speaks to multiple people and people are willing to pay for it and use and be passionate about that doesn't have some level of quirks um, that are gonna need that extra, that extra thing and above what you get out of the docs. So what makes me mad is when I run into product managers that don't go to this effort, you know, they, they publish the doc and that's it. They think their job is done. I'm like, no, no, man, you need to be out there building content or at least finding the good content and sharing it. And one of the reasons I think you should be building the content is that's how I discover a lot of problems. I go to write a blog post and I, I can't, I can't make it work. I'm like, wait a second. I know this works. Well, I never actually did the thing from step one to step in. I never actually did the whole step. I always cheated and jumped in the middle to do the step. Once I actually broke it down and tried to use it for real, that's when I knew it didn't work. That's when I knew to file the bug. Um, I know a lot of you, or maybe even all of you, don't have a 10-year support history. And I'm not suggesting that um, you go spend 10 years in support. Um, but if you can't get a job in product management, I think it would not be a failure on your part and you shouldn't feel it's a failure to go get a job in technical support and build up these skills, especially figuring stuff out. The only thing that makes me mad at my job is when someone just copies and pastes a question and sends it to me and they haven't even Googled the error message or read the docs or said, hey, I tried this and it didn't work. People just send me the questions, expect me to do their job for them. It drives me nuts. Um, so you need the people skills, be a good listener, you know, actually hear what the person's telling you. You need to be a good communicator. So you need to be able to share what your product does in a way that people can understand and excite them about. Like, so it's almost like marketing again. It's not enough that I tell you, hey, you can drag and drop from here to here to get this. You need to add that little bit of emotional weight to it, like relate to what they're doing in their personal or real lives when they're using those features. Um, and I'm able to do that because I've watched people use our products for 20 years. I know what they're doing. And in fact, I'm using my products in my daily life, too, as much as I can. If you learn nothing else in this session, please learn how to Google the error message. When something doesn't work, just literally copy and paste the error message into Google, hit enter, and you need the experience enough to know, to understand what the results look like, or at least get you closer to figuring out what the problem is. It's all about the troubleshooting. And sometimes it's really just going from getting from one error message to the next error message. Um, but so many of my coworkers problems in support and in the field and even customers, their problems could be fixed if they just simply Googled the error message. All right, so if you can't spend, you know, six years in support or in pre-sales, how do you understand what users are doing? Well, just as much as possible, you need to be able to walk what the customers are walking. Like, you know, if you're building a cloud service, spin up the cloud service from scratch, create an account, go through the steps, create stuff. When it starts to hurt, when you have to go read the docs, when you have to go figure something out, that's a pain point you've discovered. Um, and you need to be able to put on different hats. We're gonna talk about personas in a second. Um, but you need to be able to put yourself in their headspace. What are they thinking when they're not everyone's got 10 years in industry experience when they start to use your tools. Some people are coming in brand new and some people are coming in with even more experience than you. You need to be able to imagine what each of those people are doing and thinking when they go to start using your stuff. As much as you can use your own products. Sometimes I wonder if the people that made iTunes at Apple actually ever used iTunes. Uh, maybe that's not fair to them. I don't know. 
but there are certain products out there that I can just tell by using that their developers, their product teams don't actually use the products that they build because if they did, um, they would fix the stuff. It's not always possible to use your own product, but if you have to fake it, just build it, just like recording how-to videos helps you get into that space. Even if you're not actually using it for real, using it for fakes better than not using it at all. Read your own documentation. Like that's the first best thing you can do when you're a new product manager on a new product. The first thing you should do is go start reading the docs. When you run into problems, write them down and fix them. And that could be a simple comma being added to a sentence. It could be a screenshot added. It could be the whole thing needs rewritten from scratch because it never actually got tested. A lot of doc writers aren't users and a lot of doc writers aren't software engineers. They only know their docs are only as good as the information that's given to them. You know, there's a reason why they're writers and not product managers or engineers. They have technical backgrounds. They understand a lot of what they're writing. Um, but it's our job as the product manager, especially, I think, to make sure that the docs are good. So this is a great exercise and I don't do it enough. Um, you should just go pick a chapter either at random or based on questions. If you're getting questions on a certain topic over and over and over again, maybe you should go check the docs on that topic and make sure they're as rock solid as they can be. So again, this is a trick that uh, puts me in this mind space. If I get asked the same thing more than twice, I will write a blog post. If I get something asked more than 10 times, I will record a video. And that video could just be an animated GIF or it could be a whole 45 minute narrated how-to video. Um, when you go to sit down and produce that content, that's where you will find all the bugs, the missing workflows. You'll see where things are disconnected. It's, 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 it's a weird psychological hack. And something closely related to this is if you're having a problem with something and you can't figure it out, the second that you stand up and walk over to talk to a colleague about an issue, that simple physical movement, that simple like mental click, I'm going to ask for help. A lot of times the problem jumps into my head before I even go and talk to that person. It's, it's a similar, it's a similar, it's a similar mental game here, I think. Uh, I love Predator. Jesse Ventura's character is saying, hey man, I don't have time to bleed. <laughs> As product managers, we don't have time to bleed. I mean, we're bleeding. I'm not going to sit and put on my Band-Aid, you know, as I get beat up, I take those opportunities to go fix stuff, talk about stuff, make things better. And also, I'm just a huge Predator fan. I like animated GIFs, so I put that in there. Um, personas. Let's talk about personas. Um, I've read a lot of stuff on how to do the persona things. I've written persona guides before. Um in America, we have this concept known as keep it simple, stupid, or kiss. Um, personas do not have to be books. It could be three paragraphs. It could be a paragraph. Um, the important thing is you sit down and put yourself into that headspace for that person or the concept of that person and see if you can describe where they're coming from, what they're trying to achieve, um, and just the simple act of like putting pen to paper will oftentimes create um, ideas in your head or spotlight problems that you hadn't thought of before. Because it's so easy to get into our own mind space, especially true for developers. Developers are given specs or requirements and they go code that stuff. A lot of the, a lot of the um, benefits of spending time working on the personas is helping communicate why you're asking for certain things to a developer. Like, hey man, it's important developer that we build the interface this way because this person, this guy using my tool, he's not a developer, he's a business analyst. He lives in Excel all day, every day. Everything he does is based on Excel. So when we start throwing SQL terms at him, that does not helpful to that person. And being able to get my developer in that same headspace with some of these persona docs uh, is really, really useful. And the other benefit is it just forces me to, again, like, oh, yeah, I never thought about that. Because you know, once I put on my imaginary heart hat and start pretending to be someone else, that opens up different thought patterns and pathways in my head. 
Um, yeah, yeah. We don't know as much as we think we know. Like I've been doing this for 20 years. I think I'm an expert. I probably even am an expert, but God, I learn so much every day. It's not even, it's not even funny. You know, we all have imposter syndrome. I'm not sure I'm, imposter syndrome ever goes away. The, you know, people don't like being called experts. I don't call myself an expert. People will call me an expert. I've quit fighting that. Yeah, I'm an expert, but I still learn and fail and bleed every day and doing these personas helps me realize where my dark spots are where my blind spots are what i need to go research more so in terms of like keeping it simple it also has to deal with um building out the minimum viable product like what is it that we can ship that will be a success and top down on my team we do the 80 20 rule and the way we're able to do that is my boss and I both have like between us 45 years experience doing this job in the field and working with these customers. So we know pretty much what that 80% is. And when someone comes in and goes, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? If it doesn't fall into that 80% bucket, we almost immediately toss it out. We don't toss it out because it's a bad idea. We toss it out because, hey, that's great for like 3% of the people out there using the tool. And when we finish the 80%, then we can come back and start adding some of the bigger 20% 20, 20 bucket items. As you're building new product, you need a way to track what people are doing with the tool. So if you can't watch them using the tool directly, if you can't pay for research, build metrics collection into your tools. So that's why you get prompted all the time. Hey, is it okay if you share your feedback, how you're using the tool with the company? And you click yes, because all this just click yes to all those things. You know, that might be sending sanitized instrumentation data back to the developers like so for a sql developer on the desktop we get statistics like for every session you connect on the database how many people actually went and clicked on a table versus just type sql um, so i know with practical experience and with scientific information like where are the 80 percent use cases and i try to do our best to stick to building features to that 80 percent spot you need to go live where your users hang out. So I've talked about some of this a little bit. If you're building technical product for developers, it is a sin for you not to spend time on Stack Overflow. You don't have to answer a single question. Just look to see the questions that people are asking. That tells you where the problems are. That tells you where you can build solutions and product for. And then all of these other places, social, they all have various um, value. I know in India, Facebook, is super popular in the US, Facebook is basically dying. Uh, my kids uh, introduced Discord to me. You know, we now run a Discord group. We have like three or 400 customers that hang out there and they just chat with each other and they help with each other. It's great. And I can just kind of see what they're saying. Reddit is a sewer. I don't go on there too much, but I kind of just subscribe to it and see what pops up. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and LinkedIn. They're almost equal in terms of like community, um, involvement and for me to be able to share information. YouTube, again, um, that's where people go to learn stuff. Now it's slowly or quickly being displaced by um, TikTok. So I don't do TikTok. I could. I, I don't dance. I don't sing. I understand there's stuff on TikTok that's not dancing and singing. I've been told that I need to cut my stuff down and post it on TikTok, and I probably will. But what I'm more likely to do is probably hire someone about 15 years younger than me and let them take my stuff and put it on TikTok for me. I don't know. Um, but you need to be in the places where your customers are, if not actively communicating, because again, it's very easy to get sucked into the support world where you feel like you have to help every single person. But if you see where the pain points are, if you see multiple people having the same problem, that's a key to you. Hey, we've got a hole in our product line or in our docs or there's bugs. And it's important to know where that stuff is so that when you come and talk to your development team and you're doing roadmaps and you're prioritizing fixes and investment in new spaces, you can tell them why you think it's important to spend time in certain areas. So... Not everyone has time to do this 10 years to get into PM and you want to be a PM right now, that's fine. So as quickly as you can, become an asset to the product team. So if you start out in support and you see problems, don't just help from one customer, build content that helps all the customers. Um, become known. 
you know, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I want to be a product manager and I Google your name and I see you've spent hours and hours and hours on GitHub writing code to share or answering questions on Stack Overflow or you've got 10,000 people following you on Twitter, those are pretty strong social cues to me that you have what it takes to be the type of product manager that I want to work with. Um, and again, go from doing like one-on-one -on -one interactions to one-to-many interactions. Do stuff, build stuff, be stuff that tackles large numbers of people. Um, or find someone that's willing to take a bet on you because they see you have the personality and the drive. And again, you're customer focused. At least that's my pet peeve. If I see that you have those things, I can pretty much figure out, hey, we'll teach you the tech. What I can't teach you is drive, curiosity, genuine enthusiasm for helping the customer. So I thought I'd end with really quickly with some social bonus tips. Um, blogging, the main thing is just write, 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 write. And the other thing is write for yourself. If you're writing for yourself, it's never a waste of time. YouTube, go shorter videos. When I'm trying to figure out how to replace the string on my string trimmer, I hate it when they spend 10 minutes talking about the problem. I jump to the part where they actually do the thing. I get into preaching mode. You've probably seen it a little bit today. Stop the preaching on the YouTube and go straight to the problem and go straight to how to fix it. If you do have a longer video, please add chapters, add jump points so someone can go directly to the part they want to see. Personal branding. If someone hears your name, they should have an idea pop into their head. That's what personal branding is. When someone hears Jeff Smith Oracle, I hope they're thinking this, this, and this. And that's something I actively cultivate. Um, you need to be you. You need to not be you pretending to be me. Only you have your thoughts. You need to be brave and sometimes put out there and say controversial things. Hey, that's how I learn stuff. Sometimes I say controversial things and someone smacks me down and goes, that's stupid and here's why. And by me saying that, I learn their perspective and sometimes I do find out that, yeah, I was stupid. <laughs> uh, share, share, share. So even if you're not producing content, as you find stuff that's useful to you, share it to your network. And when you become a trusted member of that network and people know that when you share something, it's probably worth paying attention to. And last tips, social media. When you share links, people never click the link. So I have like uh, posts on LinkedIn where like 20,000 people saw it. And then I'll go look at the analytics on the blog post that I shared and like 45 people click the link. So here's my hack. I get the story that I want to share in an animated GIF. I post that in the body of my share and that tells my story. And it actually gets a couple of wins for me. One, as you're doom scrolling through Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, and you see pictures that catch your attention, you'll stop scrolling for a second. And then if I get you for 20, 30 seconds and you've seen my GIF, You've got everything that I wanted you to pick up. Now, if you want to learn more, you'll click the link. But even if you don't click the link, I've still won. I've hacked your brain, your mind. Uh, so learn how to talk, learn how to tell stories with pictures and animated gifts. That's a good uh, that's a good turbo um, trick. That's the end of my content. I was supposed to save ten minutes at the end for Q and A. I did not do that. I know it's late for you. I'm happy to stay on for a couple minutes and answer questions. Um, or if people need to drop off and leave, yes, I understand sir. too. There are some uh, questions in the chat box. Okay, let me pull it up. Why does WhatsApp use more than Telegram, even though Telegram has many more features? And I don't know. WhatsApp has like captured some emotional draw there. Like for me, um, I'm very much into Instagram. And part of that's because that's where my friends are. Um, when I went to Europe, everyone was like confused that I wasn't on WhatsApp. Well, none of my cohorts in America were on WhatsApp. So I never even knew what it was. But in Europe, it was like the default. Well, of course, you need to be on WhatsApp. Um, and then when I installed it on my phone, I tried using it. I just it just never really spoke to me. So I can't tell you why it's more. But it, they've they've scratched some itch there. Um, 
What do you do when reviews by users in our own analysis of a particular feature or product are contradictory? That's probably a good thing. Um, you need to start building Venn diagrams like to see where there are intersects. Um, two people can have completely different opinions on something and they can both be right. Um, their backgrounds might be different. Their personas might be different. A lot of our findings and what we know to be true are really just opinions. I mean, we make value judgments based on our own personal belief systems. A lot of times it's not one plus one equals two. Um, that experience and the more customers that you work with and know, and the more use patterns you pick up from dealing with your UI and UX experts, um, the better informed you'll be to know how much weight to give to various viewpoints. And sometimes you'll have to A-B test stuff. You'll need to go out and see, you know, get more data to figure out, you know, who is more right than the other person or who whose opinion points more to the larger share of customers that you want to win. Um, what are technologies that we need to get a hold on in getting into associate roles in product management in Oracle? Oh God. So, so Oracle's huge and we have like every product known to man, um, but in general, uh, continuous integration and development, understanding how GitHub works, uh, Scrum, all the tools like Jira and Confluent and Bitbucket and all that kind of stuff, just general like plumbing stuff is important. Um, certifications can help, but I, I, I never really look at a certification as like any sort of indicator or guarantee that the person really knows that stuff. Um, I, that's a good question. I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer. It depends on what you're looking to do. Like, I think you need to start following, um, people in that tech space and see where the frontiers, where the boundaries are to see what people are building for today and tomorrow and just become familiar and aware of that. Like it would probably be bad if you came in and didn't have any experience with Kubernetes or um, even with uh, um, Docker, because that's just how developers live today. I think that if, and if you don't know what people are talking about when they say that stuff, it kind of tells me, oh, they're not really plugged into what developers are doing today. Not all user interviews are fruitful and we can't depend on their opinion completely. Absolutely agree, yeah. Um, Interviews can be worthless if the questions you ask are not good. And I'm working on a survey right now and I have a PhD level researcher that I'm partnered with and she's the most amazing resource I've ever had access to. Like I know what I want to find out and I know what questions I want to ask. She's really helping me make sure that the questions I ask aren't loaded, aren't leading, aren't vague. Um, so that's good. But again, it comes back down to, um, experienced enough to know when you see the answers come in, maybe what they're getting to, maybe what they're trying to say, don't know how. Um, so many of these answers come back to experience, which there's only one way to get. And for me, the way to turbocharge the experience stuff is get to the ground level. Like that's why I say starting out in customer support is really a great entry way into product management because that gets you in front of customers the fastest. Uh, what is the best way or roadmap to win trust of the users? Well, you need to know what problems we're trying to solve. You know, at the end of the day, we build products to help people solve problems. In my way, in my world, it's tools. So productivity tools specifically, like there's 13 ways you can import data from an Excel file into an Oracle database table. And what I'm trying to do is build a tool that's flexible enough that it hits most of the use case patterns. Um, and the way to win trust on roadmap is figure out what that 80% is and build to it and be consistent on it. Like put out product on a regular basis without breaking stuff. Don't deprecate features, don't kill features to bring in new ones as much as you can. When you hear a developer go, yeah, we can build that, but it means we have to take this away. Push back on that. 
um, you might think no one uses a feature, but as soon as you kill it, you're going to hear from every single user you never even heard of before. You know, like, hey, what happened to my favorite thing that you killed? So for me, the way I kind of insulate myself from all of this is me putting myself out there publicly. Like the, the stress and the torment I get from the people yelling at me on Twitter, I make up for that by feeling like I have a pretty good handle on like what our users are running into because I'm listening to them in lots of different spaces. So it's stuff usually is not a surprise to me. Um, the only time I'm usually surprised is um, when we build something that I think is really simple and it just takes off like crazy. And people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. And it's like really dumb stuff like dragging and dropping cells in a spreadsheet to a common delimited list where the strings are quoted so they can put it in a SQL statement so they don't have to hit control enter backspace 27 times or write a regular expression. You know, I didn't go to college and learn that stuff. I just trialed and errored and I, I would watch customers use my product and I would see where they struggled the most. And I'd be like, oh, if they only knew this one little thing. Um, again, it's just, you got to bleed a lot. <laughs> you got to go fall down and, and learn a lot. Um, and the key thing for being a product manager is not seeing that as bad and just rolling with it and um, sharing a lot and uh, share frequently and learn from your losses as much as you learn from your wins. I got to run to my next meeting. Uh, I'll send you the slides, Harsh. Um, okay, and if sir. people want to ask so me questions, we can... reach out. Sir, can I ask a question, if you don't mind? I'll give you one more since you asked. I like making people happy. Yeah, that's that fine, sir. Uh, what about choosing your product management as your freelancing skill, freelancer, <clears throat> freelancing option? Uh, what, what do I think about freelancing as a product manager? Yeah, is like it what? possible? Oh, what a scope? I don't know. So, I think um, on freelancing, if you can hit the more marketing side of the product, um, you'll you'll find a lot of work there because a lot of us are bad at communicating. A lot mm -hmm. of us are bad at like doing true marketing. So mm -hmm. if you can bring in a fresh perspective and say, hey, man, I can help you increase your social reach. I can help you get your engagement rates up. I can help you increase the customer satisfaction rates. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, then, then you, but then you also got to be good at sales because if you're, if you're in that world, you're selling yourself. So you got to have the trust. If I look you up on LinkedIn, you better have articles out there talking about the things that you're going to help me with. And that's going to build trust in me to you. So I'm going to say, like, hey, let's give this guy $10,000 and see what happens. Okay, okay, okay. That probably means you're going to help a lot of people for free. And you're going to build up that, that reputation. Good luck, everyone. I hope you get into product okay, management. Sir. It's been a good career for me. Who knows what's going to happen in 10 years with the industry. But... Everyone take care. Yeah, so I extend my gratitude towards you on behalf of ESL IIT Guwahati and all the audience present in the session for sharing such a great words of wisdom. Thank you, sir.